I'm here with William Christie. I think he needs no introduction from me, but it's probably worth saying that he's the man who taught French music to the French, who has influenced the sound of music in the 20th century in ways far beyond you can imagine one person would do. He's an American, but he's lived in France for many decades and from his perches in Paris and his beautiful gardens in the countryside. He has um, founded and music directed the Les Arts Florissants, made enormous numbers of recordings. He now guest conducts and teaches all over the world. Um, and it's a great pleasure to see my old friend Bill Christie. Hello, Bill. Hello, Tom. It's a pleasure it's to great. Turn on the chair. Great to, great to have you here. Uh, actually, you're there and I'm here, but you know. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in music at all and how you got started in the, in the world of or the concept of early music or historical performance or whatever it was called back in those days? Well, believe it or not, it all happened in Buffalo or around Buffalo, New York. Now, this to some of my, my French friends remains an enormous mystery. Um, <laughs> but the fact is it starts out in Buffalo and it starts out essentially with a family. Um, no one professionally uh, musical in the sense that uh, there, was, there wasn't a, you know, a, a, a violinist or a, a a trumpetist, a trumpet in the family. Uh, Ma started, my mother started me on the piano when she was, I was about five or so. Um, she could have been, a, I think, a major musical personality, but, um, uh, you know, the vicissitudes of life and all that, you know, uh, just performed during the war were such that she didn't have a chance. Um, that was followed up pretty much um, again by Mum, uh, because she was conducting the little church choir at St. Paul's Church in, <laughs> in Williamsville, New York. And so, you know, it, it's not really an exaggeration to say that, yeah, when I was eight or nine, I knew who Bach was, and I knew who Handel was, and I knew who Purcell was, and I, I knew who, you know, Orlando Gibbons was. <laughs> you know? believe, believe it or not. Um, there was another... Um, uh, uh, great help for me, and I, it was my paternal grandmother. Um, somehow she had sort of, she wasn't a musician, but she liked music. Um, she, uh, she took me off of the Philharmonic. In fact, I heard my, the first harpsichord when I was, I suppose, maybe eight or nine or 10 years old from, uh, at the Buffalo Phil, played by um, a certain Squire Haskin who was a friend of my grandma's and a friend of my mother's, um, and who uh, was a church organist in Buffalo, at first Presbyterian church. <laughs> um, and grandma gave me a recording, which um, I still think to myself, I don't know how it could have been possible in Buffalo, New York in 1953 or 54 years old. Uh, but, you know, uh, I got a recording of Laurence Boulet, on Erato, uh, conducting two ladies. One was called Nadine Sotro, and the other Noemi Sotro. And they were singing, and she was playing the Leçon de Ténèbres of François Couperin Le Grand. Now, this is, it, it sounds like something made up, but it's not. Um, I was 10 or so years old, and there I was with this recording, which I literally played till it was literally non-existent on my little <laughs> tiny record player up in my little bedroom, uh, <laughs> you know. And uh, it was one of those moments when music became something very, 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 very important, mysterious. Uh, I heard things that moved me. Uh, and um, there were a series of moments like that in my young life. Um, either thanks to my ma, can you imagine my mother, uh, one, uh, one Easter she put on the, the Gloria from the B minor bass with a Theodora Tickner playing the organ, I can remember her name, so Teddy Tickner, uh, and my mother's little sort of volunteer choir, um, my god, I mean, you know, these are things that uh, remain still incredibly 
powerful. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting to me that we are so deeply influenced by the music we hear as children. I think that should be a lesson to all parents. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. And you know, I've, I've, I don't have kids, but I've told my brother and, and, and some of my cousins, for God's sakes, you know, even when you're pregnant, start listening to music, you know, it, I think it helps. <laughs> absolutely. So then from there, uh, Thank goodness that your mother exposed you to Coupin at the right time. How did you then get involved uh, actively as a musician? Well, I then I was I was sent off to to Buffalo proper. We were we were in the boondocks then, and I studied piano very seriously. And there, my head teacher Laura Kelsey, she she recognized something. She I remember her saying to me, oh, "Look, look." maybe a, a little bit less Brahms, a little bit less Beethoven, but how about some more Bach and some Scarlatti? And I said, wow, yes, that's what I want. And so she understood that there was some kind of a feeling there, you know, uh, the germ had already been, uh, been, been uh, you know, the seed had already been planted. But that was, that takes me up to the time when I essentially, I finished high school and then I went off to, to, um, to Harvard. Um, and there, my piano skills, which I think were pretty, pretty, well, they were pretty, they, they weren't, they weren't, they were, they were pretty good, actually. Um, that got me into a, a situation which I would never have dreamt possible. I and a friend of mine, a, a freshman, both of us at Harvard, became a compass of the Harvard Glee Club. Well, you know, I have heard you play <laughs> 10,000 Men of Harvard. Not everybody yeah. has. No, and I, I mean, that's part of my, only a, a small part of my football repertoire, by the way. Um, and I've dined out on that, you know, you know, can you imagine a dinner party in France where you all of a sudden you sit at the piano and you start playing 10,000 men in Harvard? It brings the, I tell you, it's a, it's a showstopper. <laughs> at any rate, there I, I, I met some wonderful people, not only um, fellow students uh, who we could share evenings listening to records, you know, but also faculty. Um, someone important in my life, of course, was Elliot Ford. Of course. Um, who also believed in me. Um, and then G. Wallace Woodward, believe it or not who took me aside when I was a junior and said, why are you fooling around trying to do something you don't really want to do? You know, I mean, you've changed sort of essentially majors, I don't know, as much as you've changed your socks. But I mean, why don't you just sort of, you know, look steadfastly in the mirror and say, I'm a musician. And that's what he said to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not exaggerating. Um, but there are also, again, these, these, these moments of, where time stops. I remember in 1966, it was, I was a senior. Um, my roommate then, David Arms, came up to, the, to, our, to our flat in Kirkland House and he said, I mean, listen, there's something incredible that's called Hippolyte and I see. It's an opera of Ramo and it's just been brought out by uh, the, um, uh, I don't know what company it was, maybe Decker. And the, in the title role, there's this incredible woman singing the role of Fedor, and she's called Janet Baker. So we mm. listened to it, and I went into a kind of a trance, uh, literally. Um, I wrote her a letter, um, and I said, you know, um, I haven't been myself for a couple of days, thanks to you, um, and I know what I want to do. Um, I never got a reply. <laughs> Except that I did, but it wasn't a written reply. It happened at Glanbourne 20 years later with her. And I suppose that, that, that's how I can sort of end off, the, you know, the, the American career. Then, of course, there was, well, no, I should add as well, a, a great weekend at Harvard, at Sanders Theatre, where um, a very, very severe looking gent got up and, and uh, on stage and played the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier, the Bach. And then the next day played the second book. And that too was pretty, um, pretty incredible. 
And um, that was just a bit before all this. Anyway, I wrote him a letter and he wrote back. I'm speaking of Ralph Kirkpatrick. Ah. Ralph, <laughs> Ralph said, look, if you're down in New Haven, do give me a bell. Um, um, and so I, I wrote back and said, well, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to play for you. And uh, could I play the harpsichord? And he said, come down. So we arranged a meeting. Um, it's interesting, perhaps 50 years and some later, to say exactly how this went, how it went. I arrived in this cavernous, sort of, uh, very forbidding Hill House Avenue uh, studio of Ralph's, which also housed on the second floor of the great instrument collection. And there he was, uh, you know, th three times as big as life, you know, very impressive guy. Yeah. And he said, well, you like your old music, do you? And I said, yes, and I especially liked what you did, you know, and that was a very extraordinary moment listening to you play back. He said, well, yeah, now, what have you done before all that? And I said, well, I was a pianist. And he said, what did you play? And I said, well, Beethoven and some way, some Schumann and some Liszt and yeah. He said, you know, I suppose if you really, I mean, you probably could play it for me, couldn't you? And I said, oh God, no, 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 I couldn't. I haven't played that music for 10 years now. He said, well, I'd rather listen to you play the piano than I would listen to you play the harpsichord. I thought this is a weird way of sort of you know getting to know me, but then I thought it occurred to me that yeah I, I put together this harpsichord recital for him you know audition in on pretty short order so I played Beethoven I played badly uh, Beethoven, uh, the Opus fourteen number one I remember the the E major uh, sonata and then I, I went on to sort of massacre one of the fantasy Stücke of of uh, Schumann. And then he said, well, yeah, it's interesting. You know, you've got your own kind of style, don't you? And I said, well, <laughs> yeah, amongst all the wrong notes, yeah. And, and a few memory slips. And he said, what else? And I said, well, I then I, I committed something which I could have never have done. I played the beginning part of the Harmonie du Soir of the of Franz Liszt, of the 18th Transcendent. And there it was. I thought it was a catastrophe, but um, and when I got to those great octaves, you know, I mean, it just went all kaflui. I stopped, and I was sweating like a pig. <laughs> and um, I don't know how long it was after that. There was some paperwork to be done with the the Harvard or the, the Yale School of Music and all that. But oh my God, he accepted me, <laughs> and that's how I spent from 1966 to 1969. But you did play the harpsichord for him ultimately. Is that how uh, you really got started? Ultimately, ultimately it was exclusively harpsichord, yes. Yeah. Although the, the 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 temptation to play the piano was rather great because one of Wagner's great pianos, of course, was sitting in the studio. Mm. A Wagner piano, a, a piano, a big Beckstein or whatever Bösendorf that it belonged to. Maybe it was the, I don't know, maybe the, the Ludwig II or something. And anyway, it was in the Yale collection and Ralph had it in the studio. But yes, I was pretty much 100% harpsichord then. Mm. And that's the thing. How, how, how did you get from there to France? Was that the next step? Well, yeah. And of course, these were pretty difficult times, um, just so socially and sort of politically and all that. We were in the midst of an awful war. I was very, very, uh, very much against the Vietnamese war. I spent 68 in a boot camp in Fort Benning, Georgia to stay at Yale uh, so that I could join ROTC, which I had never belonged to as an undergraduate. And that was pretty traumatic for me. Uh, I was, I was a good soldier because I could shinny under, you know, barbed wire pretty well. But it was a, a very trauma. It was traumatizing for me, and um, I had got a job. I don't know how I got it, but you know, but luck has been on my side for a long time. But uh, some, as there were a few gents from Dartmouth College who came down to Yale, and they were looking for someone like me uh, to teach music, music history, and have been run the scholar cantorum and what have you. And so I was up there for a year in, in 1969. And that was the worst part of the war. I mean, if you remember, that was when Kent State happened and the, 
this terrible killing of undergraduates. Um, I had made my mind up that I wasn't going to stay in the States. I was going to, and I talked to my mother and I talked to my dad about this. And, uh, and, and I said, I just, I don't want to. I, I said, if I know, I'm not, I know I'm not going to be, it was a one year contract at Dartmouth. It would have meant that essentially uh, at the end of the year, I would have been drafted. You know, they'd been, they had been trying for three or four years, the, the, the US Army. Um, so I started sort of actively working on the great move. I met someone uh, by the name of John Everts, uh, whose brother Prescott Everts was living in a place called um, uh, Windsor, Vermont, uh, in a house called the White House. And uh, John, who was uh, sort of on furlough from, from France uh, a holiday, um, heard me play. I was doing a series of, of lectures demonstrated on the obstacle at Yale, or at, at uh, Dartmouth. And uh, he said, you know, um, uh, after an initial meeting, uh, yes, you want to come to Europe. Well, come to France, he said. I said, I'm, I'm with the international rostrum uh, of UNESCO. Um, I might be able to help you out, you know, a little bit. And uh, he introduced me indeed to the help of a fellow from the French radio. I sent a tape. I got uh, a contract to do a recording and radio broadcast. I did the same thing for the BBC. I sent off some stuff to a charming fellow who I didn't know, but became a, a friend, Basil Lamb from uh, the BBC. So essentially, in the fall of 1970, I moved. It was actually at the end of the summer, beginning of the fall. And there I found myself in Europe. And here I am. And still there. Years. And so it was Hippolyte Arissi and, um, and the Maison well, uh, de Ténèbre that got you in going on the sound of French music somehow. Well, it cut me, it cut me into a, a sound world of Baroque music, you know, with instruments that I were, were still, I still captivating for me. Um, forms and rhetoric that I loved, foreign languages, which I still uh, I, I adore as well. Um, um, yes, I bought into it lock, stock and barrel. Well, you know, I was a student in France in the 60s, earlier than you, and what I remember was they really didn't have a very good grasp of their own historical music, what they then called la musique classique française. They paid, okay. lip, they paid lip service to Couperin and, and Rameau, but what they were doing didn't sound like what you are now doing, and I think you... I think you are the one who caused that change, but it must have been difficult and it must have been gradual. You know, I think what kept me going was the fact that I was close to what I loved. You know, I could touch uh, a page of Marc Antoine Charpentier at the Bibliothèque Nationale. I could actually hold a, a, one of the melange in my hands. I could go off to hear recitals, something very badly played. But you know, in churches where Coupra had been the organist, um, I could speak French, uh, which was very important for me. That also was also linked up essentially with family, because you know, when I was born, my dad wasn't with us; he was in France. Mm. This was in 1944, and he saw me first when I was well in 1945, because he was part of the American army. Um, he and my mother had an extraordinary love affair with France. Um, it had been buoyed up, I think, by, you know, other family members who had been to France and had all, you know. But at any rate, I felt at home in a very real way. Um, I had found, you know, you can't, I mean, I, I used to say in a very pretentious way, it was like Goethe going off to Italy for the first time. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's very presumptuous. But the fact is, I knew that I had come home to roost somewhere. Um, but what you're saying, of course, is absolutely true. In fact, the practice of early music in France was pretty abominable. Um, but there again, some of the most wonderful of the French that I knew back then were perfectly aware of all this. Perhaps I could talk about Madame de Chambure, La Comtesse. Yeah. 
la Comtesse de Chambure. She had a huge collection of instruments, old ones, in her private museum in Neuilly, but she also had a library that was absolutely extraordinary. The best of her instruments, as the best of her manuscripts and her books, and you know, have gone to the Bibliothèque Nationale or the Musée Instrumental uh, here in the Cité de la Musique, where I'm sitting actually right now. But she turned to me one day um, and she said, "You know, I first met you in New York." And I said, "I do remember." She was there at the Josquin des Prés conference in 1960. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And indeed, she reminded me, yes, I told you she should come to France. Well, I'm, I said, yes, I'm here. And she said, look, you can help us out. She said, I've, I've had Frank Hubbard here to take a look at my harpsichords. They've been miserably restored for years, and he's going to set all aright. Um, she was an amazing woman. She belonged to the old-fashioned Faubourg Saint-Germain aristocracy uh, by half. Uh, she was also also a very rich lady by her banking mother's family. Um, but she knew that the time was ticking and that France was really behind in terms of scholarship and in terms of disinterpretation of early music. Um, and as you said, what it, the, the weird thing was that the conservatory where they were teaching people how to sing and play Rameau or Couperin or um, singing Lully, uh, as if somehow you'd use the same technique that you use for singing Massenet or, or Gounod or even worse. I mean, how about early Verdi or, you know, or just Italian Verismo, you know? There was no, one technique would solve all the problems, you know? And you'd hear violinists, just, you know, modern vibrato, the tritone, you know, on modern, <laughs> on modern instruments, you know, and trying to sort of get them to navigate their way through a, you know, a, 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 a cupra, a piece of cupra, you know. This, but I didn't care about that. I knew what I wanted. I formed some, I, 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 I was I was at the library almost every other day. I made great friends there. They're still friends. The first president of the, of my, the outfit that I founded in 79 was Francois Lesur, who for years had been the curator in en chef of the Bibliothèque Nationale. Um, and when I decided to form after 10 years, or not even quite 10 years, an ensemble of my own, I said to myself, it's, it's first of all, it's the right time. And I've got kids, people much younger than me, uh, underhand, who want to do the same thing. They understood that there was a different way of making this music eloquent. Or indeed, it wasn't eloquent at all. And we knew what we could perhaps do to make it get its voice back, you see. And that was all, that had to do with, you know, the, the bits, and, I'm not a musicologist, but I'm mean, musicologically informed. And you know, all those moments in the States surrounded by fabulous musicologists, you being one of them. <laughs> Um, this played a uh, part, you know. I, yeah, we started to talk about historically informed performance. That was never ever discussed amongst the French, really. Right. You know? And this is important. Um, the first concerts that we did with the newly founded Art Florissant were like dynamite. Um, we respected language. We understood that you had to take French music on its own terms. And we especially understood that you had to have an input which was far greater than playing Pierre Boulez, you know, in the sense that Pierre Boulez gives you everything, you know. You, you could be literally um, a semi-alert musician, you know, of, 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 of mental uh, uh, capacity, not terribly important. Uh, but you could get through, you know, if you just followed the road signs, you know, in a bateau sans mètre, if you will. But you know, it wasn't the same thing for most French music that lacked any kind of dynamic indications, any kind of everything, you know, the tempo, you know, dynamics and articulation and what have you. And that had to be the input that somehow the French non-specialists, the, the people who were playing French music like Massenet and Guno, mm -hmm. uh, or worse, they did not understand really, or they wouldn't want to understand. And there was also another aspect of this kind of, you know, a poor sort of attitude towards their own musical 
patrimony. The, it was the, essentially, it's, this is not only a French phenomenon, the, the stranglehold that the conservatory here had on performance practice was enormous. Yeah. I mean, really enormous. We went through this in the States as well, you know, who were the most adamantly against us? Well, it was the string, the string people, you know, the violinists and all that, but also the vocal people, you know. Um, you still find this up everywhere in the world. It's still there, present, but thank God we've provided an antidote. We've provided essentially alternatives, which of course have given eloquence and new life to this music. You have, um, uh, you have taught the French their own music. It must have been a difficult uphill battle in a way because you started uh, a foreigner telling people what to do. And now you have been embraced as though you had always been French uh, and that you, uh, it was, you are sort of more French than the French now and member of the Legion of Honor and the French Academy and whatnot. But it must not always have been that way. I still get, you know, I still get to, uh, it's not, rather indirectly now, because I'm, I'm still vulnerable and I'm still attackable, but uh, it doesn't happen frontally. You know? <laughs> um, yes. Um, am I uh, an anomaly? I don't think so. I think, I don't think so. It's amazing to think that in terms of, in the literary world or in the art world, France has always relied on people who love their culture. You know, they're proud of that. You know, at one point I, I, I said something, it was a kind of a, an elaborate French sort of illusion. I said, you know, je suis un porteur de bagage. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the baggage porter, you know, at the, the train station. And you poor people, you, you, you get off the, the train and you, you, you know, the, the cultural sort of, you know, the, the weight of what you're carrying is just simply impossibly so difficult. You know? It's just, you know, the culture weighs a lot. And there we are to pick up the, the cultural bags and sort of help you sort of carry them to wherever we want them. And they, they thought that was the best thing they had heard since, you know, since I don't know what. Um, and I think in a sense, there is recognition now. There obviously is still, um, you know, the obvious, uh, well, of course, um, yes, we were, we were perhaps sort of at a low in our sort of cultural sort of um, moment back in 1972 or 73 or 74. But of course, uh, yes, we, we would have eventually gotten around to what, what William Christie has done. And wow. also, I'm not the only person, because, you know, the, the other thing is that there were other people and there are still people. You know, I mean, I one done, and it's nice to talk about someone like Jean Claude Malgois, who was a kind of John the Baptist, you know, crying in the wilderness. Um, it was more difficult for him to get across the message that to the French that what they were doing for, with early music was absolute rubbish than perhaps than, than for me saying it, you see. Uh, I never talk about. Um, the, the problems I talk about is essentially now, and I think it's 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 it gives me enormous pleasure. France has become one of the great sort of centers of, of early music in the world, and I would say that amongst the the young generation, I'm talking about the people who are 18 to 25, we've got some of the hottest talent, some of the most extraordinary people uh, in this specialty, which is. 17th and 18th century music than anywhere else in the world. When I go off to Juilliard, where you and I saw each other a few weeks ago, they understand this. Yes, they come to France now and they love it because they can get either get into, into my orchestra and into other orchestras, into other ensembles, and they're having a wonderful time because they're meeting essentially people of their own age. I'm speaking of the Juilliard students of today, uh, French students, French youngsters, who somehow, maybe we have helped out, but, but the fact is the difference between today, France, and the France of the 70s and the early 80s is, wow, what a difference. 
It's well, enormously different, and you've actually almost answered the question I wanted to sort of end up with, which is something about the difference between now and then. The world has changed, as you say, enormously in 50 years. And for young people today, there are so many things that are different. I mean, now uh, the idea of making a career out of touring and recording is probably not the way the world is going to be in the future. I mean, there's no reason just because you have created a beautiful past that you are able to predict the future any better than <laughs> anybody else. But, but do it anyway, Bill. What, do you, what, what advice do you give to a young musician nowadays who has the same sort of passionate love of early music that you had? Well, I, to people who have passion, I see something weird. Goodness gracious, you know, I have some really passionate students and friends. You've got to live your passion. And that means uh, great happiness and sometimes rather great suffering. Um, I don't think the world is a happy world now for culture. Um, I think that the French government is far less sort of cultural than perhaps they were 25 years ago. But that has to do essentially with politics, world order, the social problems that we're facing. Um, I was, I've been, I, I have to say this, it's not a very nice thing to say, but my most recent meetings with people in New York have left me very depressed, simply because politics and social issues, which have to be dealt with, somehow should be kept in abeyance for certain cultural uh, priorities as well. Um, I, I, and this morning I was with, uh, with the, 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 the people at the French Opera and I used the same words. Don't talk to me about trying to solve social issues within the, you know, the, your standing chorus and your orchestra or what have you, or um, essentially political issues. Um, at the same time that you're talking to me about making the best performance of Charpentier's Médée possible. Somehow you've got to do, you know, you've got to separate these things. It's difficult as they might be for you. Um, this is the message that obviously one tells kids. But I think that, again, to come to passion, what can you do with passion otherwise, other, other than express it? You know, you don't, uh, you don't go in, to, I mean, I'm going to be working with Teo Tim Svartz in, in the, the orchestra in, in, in 10 minutes. And we're doing the, the Paris Symphonies of Haydn, and we're doing the first, uh, the, the, the C major violin concerto. Um, why are we here? Because we love this music more than any other kind of music. And this is the thing that is going to, I think, remain the the most important aspect of music making. Um, it's going to mean sacrifice, it's going to mean sometimes hardship, but it also means moments of, of ecstasy, uh, uh, intense, intense enjoyment. I think there couldn't be uh, a more encouraging thought for the future, even spoken in the midst of very dreary times. So thank you very much for the encouragement. I hope, I hope everything you say about following your passion turns out to be true and useful and keep the world safe for the kind of music you like. We wish you a happy rehearsal. I don't know if you have any final words for the world, Bill. Well, I think that um, music can't solve the world's problems, but it can certainly accompany the world's problems in a very, very real and very important way. Um, and I've seen it happen. Well, I'm grateful to you for your part in keeping the world uh, happier and a more artful place as a result of your work. Thank you very, very much, William Christie. Thank you, Thomas.